Beware the green lady who hunts in the wood. Beware the green lady, she would grab you if she could. Legend has it a young mother lost her child in the woods years ago and has been searching for him ever since. If you listen closely, you can hear her pained cries on the wind. Daddy. And now, she'll take any child she can get her hands on who wanders in. A boy creeps through the woods, unafraid. Here he is, alone in the forest at night, and nothing. Until a sickly, tapered fingernail slides over his shoulder, and before he can even scream, gone. And today's video is brought to you by something that I'm actually really happy to promote. One of the best writing and world building softwares out there, Campfire. It's an absolute joy for me to recommend because it's made by independent people who love writing, who love world building, and it really fits with my, and I'm sure your, vibe. And it's available at my link down in the description below. Every little town has its own myths and stories. You grow up hearing them. They're deeply tied to the area and history. I bet your own hometown has its own legends, and I want you to tell me what those are in the comments below. When we create mythologies for our world, we so often focus on the gods, the creation myth, the afterlives, the grand, big, and complex stuff that all fits together. But these urban legends are on an entirely different scale. They're often small and isolated, often not very detailed, but they tell us so much about a place, a people, a history in ways other kinds of mythology don't. And yet they're often overlooked, you know, in favor of that bigger stuff, that mythological tale, those grand mythologies. Urban myths add an amazing texture and depth to wherever they're found. So let's think about them. The myth of the green lady who hunts for lost children has appeared in actually a few places, from the mysterious pine barrens of New Jersey, an ancient forest which existed far before humans ever set foot on the continent, to Hawaii and its deep and penetrable rainforests, both of them channeling that deep and unexplored, the sense of awe and mystery that comes from these incredibly ancient places in the natural world, and the propensity for children to get lost here. Urban legends stand apart from more conventional mythologies by what has been described as their minimally counterintuitive nature. What this means is where large mythologies ask people to believe in often vast, interconnected, well-defined, detailed characters with a complex canon and stories of miraculous tales, places, people, and powers, urban myths usually require a much smaller leap of faith. Cryptids, which if I may say is a fantastic word, are perhaps the most common persisting folklore legends. The legend of the Sasquatch hiding in the Pacific Northwest wilderness, or the Loch Ness monster in the vast hidden waters of of rural Scotland, the strange rabbit men in the misty prairie near your hometown, because isn't it easy to believe there might just be that mysterious rare creature we haven't set eyes on yet out there in that unexplored, untapped world? I mean, there are whole regions of planet Earth inhospitable to humans that we rarely go to, whole genres of literature that draw on the sense of that, and what might be hidden there? It's no wonder so many cryptids supposedly dwell deep underwater, the last bastion truly unconquered by human endeavor. We know the surface of Mars better than we know the bottom of our ocean. For so long, many urban myths have been dominated by this sense of the unknown natural world that will swallow us up if we go out there alone. It's dangerous, it's awe-inspiring, and what could be there? Even today, we're still uncovering creatures unfamiliar, unseen, strange, and bizarre, with biologies that sometimes make us squirm. And if they exist out there, well, who knows? There's a legend called El Quiero Vivo, the living leather, said to inhabit some of the deep rivers and forgotten lakes of the Andes Mountains in Chile, where, again, very few people are able to go. It looks like a piece of leather made from a whole cow, able to jump from the water and swallow its victim down whole, teeth at its edges, leaving behind a lifeless 
shell. And this is just one way urban legends can enrich the tapestry of your world. You'll notice the stories of the Green Lady, of Loch Ness, of El Quiero Vivo all draw on the unknown, the unexplained, the unmapped, unclear, the strange and abandoned places of the world. With just enough mystery, with just enough of a gap in human knowledge to justify why people cannot consistently find these things. It's why these tales are so regional. They're attached to physical places you can go to, you can find, and in that they become part of the cultural narrative of the region. This, they say, is a dangerous place. This, they say, is somewhere you will get lost in, you will get taken. This place, they say, hides something. This place, they say, has something happen here that we can't explain. The local people have a relationship with these places that often gets expressed in urban legend. Because there's a certain power and terror to places that humans cannot control, that they have not yet mastered or conquered. So it's no wonder these places are such fertile ground for cryptids, legends, myths, and horror stories. And it can be as simple and small as the way the light hits a waterfall or a lake or a tree and makes people think they see something there, the shape it casts, the shadow it creates. And it can only happen there, in that specific place, but enough people in the village see it to enter the cultural memory. Of course, urban legends do spread sometimes. The myth of Bloody Mary, where you say her name in the mirror 13 times and you see her ghostly, devilish face, it's evolved over time and spread throughout the world. It went from a peculiar wedding divination ritual to become the Hanako-san myth in Japan, which shares a lot of similarities, taking on the unique cultural sensitivities of this new place. So you can also use use myths like this to explore cultural exchange. Why would they take root in some places but not others? But here's the thing. In a way, a lot of these stories don't feel like believing in a mythology or the supernatural a lot of the time. It's why these stories are often so palatable to so many people. It's the idea that you might not believe in gods or apocalypses, you might not even believe in specifically the Green Lady or El Quiero Vivo, but you might be willing to believe that there is something out there in the forest, that something happened in that asylum all those years ago that we can't quite explain, that we don't quite understand, that led to something terrible. And we can't dismiss that feeling, and so it manifests in an often nebulous belief in some kind of urban myth. Where those supernatural elements do emerge, they're often ill-defined and flexible, allowing you to interpret them or minimize them in your own way. While the popular vision of a vampire was codified with Bram Stoker's 1897 novel Dracula, the concept had existed for thousands of years, with iterations ranging from strange, vicious cryptids to normal people who drank human blood and suffered the consequences, becoming deformed, to supernatural entities caused by malevolent spirits. Everything from beastly cryptid to intelligent, and the same can be said for werewolves. The range of natural to supernatural descriptions and causes and features allowed the legend to adapt, to remain explicable and a mainstay for any number of strange events, with stories embracing these over time, even today in stories like Castlevania, a patchwork expression of the supernatural features which have still persisted. And these sorts of urban legends go well beyond cryptids out in the wilderness. You will have heard stories about old asylums, abandoned military buildings, empty houses, houses, old battlefields, cemeteries, where dark and terrible things would have once happened, some of them seemingly inexplicable, or at least unexplained, and those who go there may even report strange things in line with that, maybe because they were expecting it, or maybe something else. Because this is a second way urban legends enrich our understanding of a place, of your world building. They are a lens through which we understand our history. They personify and mythologize our cultural prejudices, our taboos, our hierarchies, our mysteries and tragedies, almost as a way of crystallizing and preserving these parts of our history in a more 
concrete way. They represent ways we look at ourselves and each other. Many American urban legends from the 18th and 19th centuries have a deep racial commentary, like the night doctors, ghostly figures with needles in their hands who would supposedly roam the streets of southern cities and kidnap African American men to dissect them in terrible ways, with some basis in truth. African American bodies were bought and sold and cut up for medical schools, often stolen from their graves because the law did not care to protect them, and this time period was rife with racially motivated murder as well. White communities at the time would even use these myths to frighten black communities and prevent them from fleeing to more friendly states. The image of the ghostly Ku Klux Klan member was even incorporated into the myth at one point, and the stories of just what they did expanded and developed with time as that myth and those prejudices developed too. An 1896 piece in the Journal of American Folklore reads, On dark nights, African American people in cities consider it dangerous to walk alone on the streets because because the night doctor is abroad. He does not hesitate to choke colored people to death in order to obtain their bodies for dissection. The night doctor grew out of real events, but really developed and expanded as a reflection of the fears and prejudices of the day. And just as commonly, going beyond this, our prejudices, our taboos, our hierarchies will change how the real events, whatever these legends might be based on, end up getting interpreted, or even fundamentally changed. Are particular groups more likely to be painted as victims or heroes? Are particular details more likely to stick around? What kind of myths are they likely to believe and perpetuate? What would they warn against if they are cautionary tales? They might be more likely to blame the marginalized, the poor women or people of color. You can actually see this dynamic vividly in H.P. Lovecraft's work, which while strictly speaking is not urban legend, it expresses itself and structures itself very much like an urban legend system for New England, with all of the same tropes. The cultists he depicts are nearly always people of colour, and that is intentional in his case. Then there's the little known Eastern European tale of the Black Ambulance, which would kidnap children to harvest their organs, only to dump them on the side of the street with little memory of it. This legend arose from two things at the time though. Human trafficking in Eastern Europe led to a large illegal organ trade, which still goes on today to an extent, and the NKVD, the Soviet secret police, who would often drive the car people described, playing on that fear of how people would disappear with little warning. These tales are used to represent, reflect, and to a lesser extent explain the fears, hopes, and tensions of a place. And these can be very local, very contextual, fears and hopes and tensions which do not matter outside of this very specific area, whereas a lot of mythologies tend to deal with much larger questions of life and survival. Stories, events, and questions which may not translate or be that relevant to other communities, but hold immense weight for this one that shape their cultural narrative and how they view themselves and others. A murder in a local mansion becomes the origins of a ghost. An eclipse becomes a terrible sign for any marriage after a man happens to be left at the altar during one. A large grate on the side of the road is where a clown waits for the rain to get so heavy that it can kidnap your children and leave their bodies floating out later. We all float down here, they say. In 1981, Springfield, Illinois, a man took an axe to some people in a local hardware store. He mauled them and left. He was never identified, and you can only imagine the sort of myths that rose from that. These stories, which may not spread to the rest of the country, but hold immense importance to the people who continue to live there. It has implications for their community, but perhaps not others. So these myths don't only define a town by how they came to be, but how they continue to be used. When they tell them, why they tell them, who they tell them to, how they rationalize them, weaponize them, who listens to them to. And that'll change over time as the town changes. Does something that started out as a warning or a cautionary tale or, or something dangerous become a party game? What tragedies defined the town you're creating? What tensions are there that might shape the legend? Prejudices, taboos, hierarchies which might be exhibited in these legends. Even if they reflect real events that happened, what would 
naturally be remembered and which details would be omitted or sidelined or doubted. Oftentimes these stories are remembered not only because they're maybe shocking or horrific, but because they run counter to what people expect. The fact that it's their story only makes it more memorable. I actually wrote a story that incorporates a lot of this called The Life and Death of Lucia's Library. It's about a family who have a book in their library made from the feathers and wax of death's cloak. The book supposedly tracks their life and predicts their death, and the whole story is about the different ways that people engage with death that they think about it. It's an urban myth in its own right, and the consequences of how people keep it alive. And you can read this urban myth story in my book, A Catalogue for the End of Humanity, which is out now, along with a ton of other fantasy and sci-fi stories down the link below. I've talked about creating mythologies and religions a lot on this channel. It's a fascinating corner to world build in because it tells us so much about the people. It's complex and fascinating stuff. And it's why I put all of the writing and world building discussions we've got into these easier to read and reference books on writing and world building volumes one, two, and three. And three, by the way, is just out right now. It's the biggest and best volume yet, with like 27,000 words worth of extra detail and depth that I can never get to in these videos. No, you don't need to have read volumes 1 and 2 to read volume 3. They stand entirely separately, covering entirely different topics, but they do work hella well as a collector's set. And you can get a catalogue for the end of humanity and see how I put all of this stuff into action. But I want to look at one particular fascinating urban myth, which persists today. In La Paz, Bolivia, there are rumoured to be, quote, elephant graveyards hidden in the myriad of empty buildings and basements across the city, where people who wish to die are given a bucket of alcohol and a room to die in. For a city with a lot of abandoned buildings, the idea that any closed storefront, any rundown house, any ruins or foundations, any curtained window or shuttered place could be an elephant cemetery, it's airy, the idea that you might be near one at any time. There's that unfalsifiable gap, and while there is perhaps some basis to these stories, the police have confirmed they do exist somewhere, the legend has grown much deeper and further, a city built on the dead. Unverifiable, but you know something has happened before, and this manifests in this kind of aura around the city. Because no person can prove they don't exist, and that's enough for it to spread. This is a really fascinating example because it's in like a modern city. It's not just out in the wilderness, it's not based on like past events. It's something which is still kind of seemingly happening in some way, and it's based on real places you could find in a populated area, you know? These stories take a kernel of truth, and the human mind runs with it, with cognitive and confirmation bias. They run on instinct that even when you know it's impossible, a feeling is still hard to ignore. I live out in the country. The roads between the city and my home are dark and long, with no lights except my own. And when it's late enough, when I'm just alone enough, even I find myself checking the back of my car in the mirror, even though I know nothing is there. Because just maybe. Urban legends prey on the edges of easy belief. And you might be thinking that in worlds with magic and real fantastical creatures who are out there in the wilderness and hunting people in these horror stories, well, there wouldn't be quite as many kind of urban myths. But see, the urban myths are based on the same forces of the human mind, really, and those will still be there in these stories. In A Song of Ice and Fire, there's an urban legend about the rat cook. A cook who was wronged by the king, and in his anger, he fed the king his own son in a pie. And the cook was cursed forever to be a rat himself and to eat his own young. The legend is a cautionary tale in the world of Westeros. It's a tale about mistreating guests beneath your roof. See, the cook is not a villain because he murdered. He's not the villain because he made the king a cannibal but because of that huge taboo on mistreating guests. That moral framework shaped the interpretation of the events that may or may not have happened. It painted certain people one way or another, certain actions. Asylums are one of the most iconic sources of urban legends. They show up all the time, and given the number that have closed down and yet remain standing, the places that you can still often visit, they're this really intoxicating source of mystique. 
and from them comes this idea of crazed killers beyond normal criminals, even turning mental illness into a superpower, a trope which persists in a lot of stories today. But how we tell stories that style themselves like urban legends around asylums has actually seemingly shifted over the last couple of decades to reflect a change in our understanding of them too. In the game Until Dawn, the psychiatrists and doctors experimenting on those kept illegally in their care are partially responsible for the creation and destruction caused by the Wendigo, a disfigured and cannibalistic monster. Other stories like Alice the Madness Returns also depict doctors of the asylum as responsible for the mythic horrors which happened there. This isn't perfect because of course the people kept as patients in the asylum were still the monsters, but in a sense it does reflect our evolving understanding of asylums as usually very deeply cruel places for people who really needed help and were subject to horrific treatment from just electrocution to lobotomies. It was bad, and we're seeing that come out in the stories now a lot too. Another way we know legends are changed is with the spread of certain types of religion or with colonization. So a lot of local legends throughout kind of the Celtic world, the Nordic world, Aboriginal world, uh, were eventually incorporated into kind of a Christian mythology where they were turned into demons or angels. We can definitely see this with the fairies in Celtic lore, which were drastically changed to fit this uh, new kind of moral binary. Alternatively, the exact shape your cryptids might take will reflect the sensitivities of the people living there. Like, a lot of cryptids have hooves and goat horns, and those have religious connotations. It's no wonder creatures like the Jersey Devil have been depicted like that. Some animal features are regarded as normal to some people, or scary and foreign to others, or like we see in a lot of Nordic urban legends, creatures often turn up as deformed versions of what we already know, a moose with six eyes or twisted antlers. So the question becomes, what would the local people draw on? Which animalistic features would they see as good, bad, evil, strange, bizarre, twisted, frightening? All of this might make it sound like urban legends are something relegated to the past. We're too smart now. We've got cameras and recording and that means, of course, we can tell, right? But as we saw with La Paz and the elephant graveyards, it's very much not the case. Slenderman is probably the most famous urban legend of the last couple of decades, but it's a very strange case, because unlike a lot of legends, we know precisely how Slenderman came to be. In 2006, a user called Victor Surge posted these images on an online forum as part of a Photoshop competition. And yet, despite this, Slenderman has entered the public consciousness as an urban legend with numerous reported sightings and even, in one tragic case, an attempted murder. In 2014, two 12 year old girls lured another child into a forest and stabbed her 19 times in an attempt to quote, appease Slender Man and gain access to his mansion, supposedly in Nicolet National Forest. The victim survived, if barely. Urban legends have power, but only because we give them that, because we spread them and believe them and act on them. There's this strange cycle where a place feels dangerous because of the legends, and then something actually does happen there, and we take it as further evidence of the legend, even if statistically it's just as dangerous as somewhere else. We're still inventing legends, and so long as there is the gap in human knowledge, as we have those doubts and fears and insecurities, and the little moments where you're driving through the dark and you check your back seat, they're gonna persist in a way. They're gonna sit in the back seat of the human mind and prod. We're still gonna take that little leap of faith. In fact, the belief in vague legends or the supernatural paranormal is dropping at a lower rate than belief in traditional mythologies and religions. Because it's that feeling, right? Who knows? There might just be something in the woods taking the children someone harvesting organs, a serial killer out there in a pale mask that's really tall in a suit. Who knows? This serves as an example of how easy it is for these sorts of stories to enter the public consciousness, even when we know they're invented, and how people invent, perpetuate, and expand these legends by believing, in a cycle of sorts. But there's something else to keep in mind. I know in this video we've talked a lot about the horror stories, the tragedies, the things that go wrong and we mythologize and turn into dark tales that we tell around the campfire, but 
Urban legends can be positive and good too, and that means a lot. For every story about the monster in the forest kidnapping children, there's the unicorn that's beautiful and grants wishes. There's the selkie of Scottish folklore who might help lost sailors at sea, or the healing stones of Lake Baikal, which can help you uh, progress spiritually and heal yourself and your mind, and they're hidden deep at the bottom of the lake if you can find them. Whether your hometown imagines a ghost that guides a child home when they get lost, or a ghost devouring them because they are, says something about the parenting perhaps, or how they view the city. Is it a dangerous or a safe place? Positive urban myths are just as important and mythologize events in a similar way. The human mind is kind of pre-programmed to remember tragedy. So I want you to do something. As an experiment, take a town in your world. Not a big city or a country, but a little town, like this one that I've got here, and figure out an event that would give rise to an urban legend. Figure out a bias or prejudice or sensibility which would change the shape that legend takes. See what physical geography might play into it, the relationship the people who live there have with that place, and the narrative that this legend helps these people tell about themselves to themselves. If they include supernatural elements, then how do they arise? How widely are they believed? And how are they reinforced? And a really good way to do this whole exercise to put all of this together is to use campfire, where you can mark out your own map, all the different legends that define these places, and then detail them in your own encyclopedia. You can put together a timeline for your world's history. You can write up a whole page about the species your cryptid might be based on. Campfire is just very clearly built by writers for writers. It is very intuitive, and you can now even write your whole manuscript inside campfire. It's a feature that I know a lot of people really want because they want to be able to then connect it to their encyclopedia where they've got all of their world building, connect those dots. I don't do a lot of sponsors by choice, but I took Campfire because they are doing the sort of stuff that I really like to support. Independent creatives helping each other tell cool stories. Now, these programs like Campfire only work when they actually do help you imagine and plan and tell your story, and Campfire does exactly that. There's pages for character creation and magic systems and timelines, there's the manuscript, and now they actually even help you publish it if that's the path that you want to take. And make money from your book, which I think is really cool. It's run by really incredible people. But you've got to use my link. I know you just want to like search it up, but using my link really helps me personally, and through that really helps Campfire as well. The world is shifting towards independent writers with more ways for writers to make money than ever, and Campfire is at the forefront of that, and I really want to support them in doing so. It's why I am so happy to promote them on the channel. Let me know what you think of Campfire, stay nerdy, and I will see you in the future.